All right, hello. So I thought we'd uh, do something uh, a little different today instead of talking about uh, the components like Greg did or, or other things Microsoft has done on the Project Olympus. We'd talk about uh, one of the cloud applications that's using the platform and, and why we're uh, doing what we're doing, uh, at least from the point of view of, of Azure Storage application, which is the, the business group I work for at uh, Microsoft. All right. So, you know, why is cloud different? Why don't we just buy uh, uh, Xeon servers from one of the OEMs and, and storage from one of the st storage OEMs or a few of the storage OEMs? And we've tried that. Uh, and, and there's certain, certain issues with that uh, because of a few factors. Um, you know, first, the expectations uh, of the service and of the customers are different. You know, you buy uh, a server uh, or a piece of storage and, and you know you have it and, and you're, you're managing it and it has issues, you work through them, but our, our customers and our service, they, they treat it more of, more of a utility. So it just has to, has to work. And so there's certain requirements that drives that, that, that there's no, you know, the usage model's different. And then the scale, you know, so think about how big you think, you know, Microsoft Cloud or, or some of the big hyperscalers are, and they're much bigger, and they're growing really fast. And we'll, we'll talk about how each of these, uh, these differences influence some of the requirements and, and, and some of the things we're doing is, is what I'm gonna try to do today. So, Project Olympus, uh, hopefully you've seen it out on the, uh, the, the show floor there. We have all our hardware. We actually developed it in the open, so we've been showing it over the last you know, year or two. Um, and so as, as we make progress, we, we show what we're doing. And so really, it's, it's our whole uh, server and, and, and rack architecture. So we start with the rack and the power, power uh, distribution unit. And then you put in various modules uh, to build up your rack. And so, you know, we have uh, various compute modules. Uh, we're showing several of them uh, on the show. We have a few storage modules. This is our hard drive one, which we're, sh we're showing there. Um, we have a, a, an SSD one also using the EDSFF long uh, ruler that Greg talked about. Um, we're we're uh, in the middle of the development of that product. It'll, it'll be finished in a few months. Uh, and so we're looking forward to, to deploying that type of solution. Uh, and so when a, a, so our data centers, they provide services, right? We, we have various compute services in Azure. We have a hard drive storage service we call standard storage. We have an all SSD storage service we call uh, premium storage. We have an archive storage, uh, tape as a service. And so when a data center needs more capacity or a region needs more capacity of, uh, uh, whatever, whatever the service is, the orderable unit isn't a rack or a server, it's a row. And so that is the orderable unit if you need more of this size VM or, or hard disk storage or SSD storage. And so the, the, you know, the roadmap for each of these services, this is what the cluster looks like or the, the row looks like. And, and, and so, you know, this is what you buy today if you need that service. This is what you need to buy tomorrow if you need that service. And, and for each of those, we're really pushing uh, the technology to, to provide a better service, be more efficient, you know, whatever the, the goal is. And so those are the, the requirements of what we do. And so Azure Storage is a storage as a service. It provides all sorts of... Uh, uh, storage services for developers that, that look like what you could get from your NAS and, and SAN vendors on premise. Um, but the customers, you know, they just, you know, see this service. And so there's, there's a lot of expectations with that um, and that are somewhat different than, than enterprise. Um, and so, you know, from the customer standpoint, Availability, 
you know, it's not okay to have the service down ever. If, if one of our services is down in one area for a little bit, everybody is w figuring out what happened and putting it back up, but it almost never happens. Um, and so any, any types of failures, um, the server fails, this component fails, this rack fails, um, you know, there's redundancies and everything, and the user should still be able to access their data. So the, the goal is it's always available. And, and so we're, we're, we design, design the architecture to meet that goal. Data protection. So, you know, Greg was talking about if you still do RAID. At our scale, if we did RAID, we'd be losing customer data every day. Um, and, and the scale is huge, and we've never lost customer data. And so you, you need to do different data protection. And then the other type of failure, which RAID doesn't even pretend to, uh, to address, is uh, soft errors. So every component in the server that touches the data, the, the disks and the networking and the memory and the CPU and the FPGAs and anything else you have in there that, that touches data, there's some chance that it's going to corrupt things. So you get a hard disk and it says, you know, for every 10 to the 15th bits read, we're going to have, you know, some sort of an error. We're going to corrupt your data or, or whatever. SSD is the same thing. Memory, they have, they have an error rate. Uh, CPUs, you know, Intel has a soft error rate. Um, if you, you know, turn, you know, turn to screws, I'll tell, talk to you about it, but, you know, generally don't talk about it. But all these things have. And so we corrupt data every day if we didn't protect against this at our scale. You know, when you have a million servers or that, that order of magnitude, you know, these things happen all the time. And so for, when you store your data, we actually do things to protect that. And, uh, um, you know, you could think, well, you know, you put a, some sort of a, a mathematical computation on that to, to see if there, there's an issue. Um, and maybe you encrypt it, and then you save it. Well, what if in, while encrypting it, you had a soft error? So you have to encrypt it, and then unencrypt it, and make sure you get the same thing back, and then save it. And so there, there's these, all these usage models in cloud to provide this you know, better IT than you can do yourself type experience. And, and so these, these drive a lot of the decisions on the, hard, on, on the hardware and on the, on, uh, the software, both, you know, working together. Uh, security. You know, every, all data is stored in Azure storage. It's, it's encrypted. And, but we're also, you know, this is a, a big network cloud, so we're worried about other things. So there's, you know, today there's, there's firmware signing processes that you've seen in the, in the industry for a little while, and then we're, we have a new initiative uh, to harden that even some more with the, the Cerberus project. And so making sure there's no way in for malicious stuff is, is an ongoing thing, and there's additional teams of people working at, on other aspects of security, and these are just a couple, but uh, that's a, a br pretty big deal. And so being a, a trusted cloud is, is one of the, the, the tenants of the Microsoft Cloud. Um, and then performance of services. So we sell a service, you buy this virtual hard disk or, or this type of service, there, there's, there's an, uh, an SLA there. And so just because I'm doing all this f fancy transformations to make sure the data's encrypted and, and uh, you know, there's no soft errors, you know, I have to do that at, at, a, at the performance expectations. And, um, and so I, I, there's hardware solutions to make that go fast. And then there's other phenomena. So in the past, before this, we were you know, buying um, uh, OEM uh, storage solutions. And we had this phenomena that some drives in some places were, were slower than others because they were getting extra vibration from the fans and stuff like that. So this, I'm sorry, this new JBOD uh, that we're doing, uh, you know, we provided them to all the hard drive vendors uh, beforehand. You know, for the last you know, year and a half while this thing was being developed. And so every time we, we iterated on the JBOD, we, we 
you know, we would give new copies to our, our, our hard drive partners and our, our SAS HBA partners and stuff and make sure that any recommendations were put in there because these hard, these, the data on the hard drives is getting so dense that you know, little, little issues cause problems and the hard drive uh, vendors with Hammer and Mammer have these roadmaps to, to several times the density of the drives. So we need something that's gonna be good for the next several years. Um, and then the other, other uh, hard drive trend, which you know, was into our, our uh, JBOT is, uh, you see an announcement uh, a couple months ago or so from Seagate on split actuator, multi-actuator drives. And I, I think there's some floating around the show here. But one of the problems with hard drives has been your capacity has been, been going up over time and your performance has been pretty flat. And so we're trying to provide a, a service you buy you know, this, this, this many gigabytes of storage and it has this much performance. So there's, there's an assumed temperature of that data that the hard drive is, you know, more and more, you know, ill-equipped to, to serve. And so uh, providing a, a good environment for those drives, which have some additional requirements and stuff, um, you know, is, is part of what our designs. So on the, uh, the scale, so Azure, uh, is in 50 regions, and we have many data centers in each of those regions. Uh, and so the, the scale is pretty much as fast as we can build things. Um, and so uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that, but it's uh, a lot, so the fact that you have to deploy so much so fast at such a growth rate has to influence uh, you know, how you build things and, and how you design things. And so uh, there's, there's a lot of design choices because of that. And so uh, one of them is, you know, in the past for some of these solutions, if, if we would have bought uh, a, a OEM solution, and maybe we want to multi-source it for, there's a few different reasons we might want to, and buy one from vendor A and vendor B and vendor C. Well, now I'll, they may all look the same, hold about the same number of hard disks or SSDs or whatever they're supposed to do, but the firmware is a little different and the manageability is a little bit different and, and, and their characteristics of how the SAS expanders work or the PCI switches work or whatever is a little different. And all those little difference means the time to qualify things and iterate and, and when there's a problem, debugging things is worse. So simplification of a design that you know, with a design that we own and we have, we own the firmware too, uh, you know, it's, we're on uh, several of these open source firmware projects are in here. Uh, these pr products have, have open BMC, for example. There's, there aren't these black boxes that are just trust us. And, and so we can uh, debug with the code, we can audit the code for security issues. We, we, we have all those rights and abilities and, and the staffing. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, there's certain manageability requirements when you're managing this many servers. Um, you know, how do you know what's failed? Uh, the power, you know, there's, there's some schemes where our nodes actually want to use, know if there's additional power available in the rack to do optional things, for example. And so we have, we have this management scheme where things can, can understand what's going on. Um, and uh, yeah, debugability. Um, you know, when there's some sort of an issue that's it's a, a class issue, we see lots of failures. We can the service will still be up if there's failures, but the real fear is that you get failures at a rate that you really can't you can't manage, right? And eventually, a service you know would have issues. And so, being able to debug things and solve problems in the field is an issue. And occasionally, you have with some component some issue you didn't expect. And, and being able to figure out what it is and, and, and that, those types of things uh, influence what we do. Uh, and then efficiency. Uh, a lot of the uh, things we do, people expect things to get more efficient, be cheaper over time. Uh, it's a competitive industry. And so we're, we're seeing, we're really pushing with both the hard drive vendors and the SSD vendors and the infrastructure we're doing uh, several, uh, on several axes to be more efficient. So 
Um, we're going to be an early adopter of uh, SMR drives. We've started buying them for, uh, for production. Um, and so in SMR, they just, so to, for density, you know, you have the, how close the bits are, are together around, around the disk and then how close the tracks. So the tracks get so close that it affects how you write. And there's a little bit of work you need to do, but uh, we, we, we're, uh, we're excited about those. As I said, we want a future proof for these, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 terabyte drives that are coming. Uh, we need the IOP density of, of multiple actuators. Um, another one, when you have many millions of drives, you have, there's different failure cases. And so one of the ones um, we worked with the, the industry on is, you know, these drives we're buying in cloud, they're, they're seven, eight, nine, uh, disks, so you get two X set and heads, and one of the failure cases is a head fails. And, and so, which you can throw out the disk and somebody loses a few hundred bucks, um, and they fail all the time, or, but what, what we're gonna be doing here is we're gonna say, well, just don't use that part of the disk anymore. And so we're gonna, uh, they call depopulate that much capacity. And, and we can reformat uh, the disk and put it back online. If we have to rebuild the disk, it, it's kind of a distributed rebuild, so it happens in you know, seconds. And so you know, there's a little dance you do when you want to do something like that. Um, and and uh, all the Azure systems, if you, you look at the Olympus systems, one of the, the requirements is a certain cooling efficiency. And so our data centers, there's a ratio between how much power you can consume and how much air can go through the server. And so we, we have you know, air handlers for a row of servers and there's power allocated for a row of servers and there's a ratio. And so you can't just blow the fans as fast as it takes to, um, to cool, the, uh, the cool the component. You have to design it so you can cool it efficiently within this, this envelope. And so uh, all those things in, influence what you see there. So you see our, our compute server, our Perly compute server has this big radiator CPU on it with heat pipes and stuff. And, and our, our JBOD, it, it channel, channels air, cool air into the middle rows of the drives. Um, and all, another thing we're doing with the JBOD in that thing is, is you know, some of the legacy chassis, they'll control the fans based on you know, how hot the data center is. We'll actually read the temperature of the drives and, and, and try to tune it both for cooling efficiency and also for the drive life expectancy. We have some data on, on how, how cool drives should be to, to last longer. Um, and then on these new EDSF rulers, as Greg was saying, being that the connector stands up from the, the motherboard as opposed to a, a mid-plane type design, the air just flows right through them, so it's, it's more efficient. And so all around these, these are, are just designed for a certain CFM per kilowatt uh, or better. So, uh, so uh, to, to achieve these things, those are kind of the requirements. I think I have a pointer here. Um, or not. Um, so we, we, we compose, you know, we put, if we're doing a hard disk storage system, we have, have our JBOD does its stuff and we, we connect them up to externally the compute blades. Um, and we use the same blade that Azure Compute would use, just maybe configured with different amounts of memory or, or whatever the requirements are in a, a SAS card. In the past, we'd, we'd put them in the storage box and they'd sit behind the, the hard disks, which was bad for cooling. It was more difficult because it was a custom motherboard designed for the storage enclosure, so it was additional development that you had to do every time there's a new CPU. Uh, and so this way, we, we just cable up, and it, it ends up being okay. Uh, Density-wise and stuff, uh, uh, there, it doesn't, doesn't hurt you much. And then efficiency, it helps you quite a bit from a cooling and, and from a flexibility. And, and really, if you do things that slow you down, you know, being a few months later, you know, you're not taking advantage of a new generation. So that's actually pulling things in. Because the reason you do the next generation is, is better than the last one. If you're shipping a 14 terabyte drive instead of a 10 terabyte drive, you want to get those out as soon as possible. So that's kind of the things. Whoops. So, uh, so the goal of Azure is to, to host, as I say, all the data. And 
and the scale we're doing, imagine if you had to buy and deploy 100,000 hard disks a week. That's the type of scale that the top cloud providers are doing. And those, there's certain problems associated with that type of scale. Um, and so providing every usage model that they have uh, on-premise, but at a higher level of SLA, is really the goal of this type of, uh, type of service. Um, and then our customers, as I say, their expectations are different. They're just worried about running their application, and we're just a utility. And so, you know, where if they bought this, you know, NetApp filer, they know they bought it, and, well, we have to take it down this weekend to service it or whatever and upgrade it. That's okay. In this case, you store it, and if we have to change the hardware, you know, we should move the data, you know, and you shouldn't even know about it. And, and so there's just operational models that are, 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 you know, totally different, and you have to account for them and simplify for them. And, uh, and that's why we're doing the uh, Project Olympus hardware, and that's from the point of view of Azure Storage, uh, you know, how we're looking to take advantage of it here. We'll uh, be rolling it out this year for both hard disk and, and SSD systems, hopefully. So if you have questions, we can address those or... So. Yeah, we have um, quite a few minutes for, for questions, okay. so if anyone has any. Yes, sir. Where exactly are you with regard to rolling out? Rolling out. So, so, well, the services are alive. Um, you, the JBOD. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, I'm sorry. Where are we out with respect to rolling these out on, on Olympus? The services exist. Um, you know, services get more and bigger and more featureful over time, which is kind of a, a different, uh, more of a software differentiation. But the, the JBOD is uh, exits validation at the end of this month. Uh, and so that one, uh, we already know we, exactly what the recipe for that row is. So, you know, we'll be looking to do that as soon as uh, we can get everything uh, qualified and stuff. Uh, the the JBOF, uh, it, it was a little later in the schedule. It powered on in December. We're showing it here, but it's, it's more mid-year for the, um, uh, the exit validation. So we, we would, we're, we're working on what the recipe for that cluster, that the row definition is now. Um, and we'll probably have that locked in the next couple months. Um, and, uh, and so those, uh, and those, and that'll be, what those services buy for, until the technology gets better. For hard drives, maybe till dual actuator comes out or something, and then we'd have a new definition, for example, or you know, bigger drives or whatever the technology is. And so we'll, we'll, we'll pick, uh, as I say, a, 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 we did pick a, a, a definition of what the hard drive is that the industry is, is able to, to produce, and uh, we will pick a, an SSD, and we're, we're excited about that new form factor, and we'll, we'll be locking that shortly. Okay, another question. Yeah, just, just curious. There's, there's a lot of things going on in the hard disk drive land, which is quite interesting in terms of next generation capacities, and you mentioned dual actuator a couple times, but there seems to be a little bit of a difference between hammer versus mammer, so I'm curious if you can kind of... Uh, Double click on that, is that important, is it not? So, so the important part is, uh, is that the capacity goes up over time. Because the problem you have is, as I said, you know, how big everybody is. The other thing is you know, hard drives, even with these technologies, are going to have a capacity of CAGR of 20% or plus or minus. The cloud CAGR is triple digits. Uh, so if you looked at the last um, earnings announcement from Microsoft, they said Azure revenue was up 96% year over year, and, uh, and that in the la last several quarters, they've said basically the same thing. Technology gets cheaper over time, so you can apply the number of cores, the number of hard disks, all that stuff, you know, might be a bigger number. Um, and so that's the basic problem is, is cloud storage and, and cloud compute is, is growing at a faster rate than um, the industry growth, the industry technology cadence is so the actual number of disk drives, number of servers, number of networking, all that stuff, uh, you know, goes up over time, and so we need more megawatts over time. Another question, Mike. Uh, you mentioned that 
Uh, if you just use traditional RAID approaches, you would have data failures, and you don't want data failures. Yeah. So can you tell us what you do use in order to avoid those data so, failures? So, um, yeah, so the most common case of data failures is, is you lose something, and then when you're trying to rebuild it, you have some sort of correlated failure, uh, a grown defect in a hard disk or, or, or whatever. And you could have two failures and stuff in that, and there's, there's lots of those things. So. Uh, uh, a couple of things. One, we use uh, uh, an erasure coding scheme that gives us much more protection. And then two, when we need to rebuild something where RAID may take all day to re rebuild the drive, we can rebuild it in a minute. And so the, uh, the exposure time for a correlated failure is less, and we can handle more correlated failures. So. Hey, Mike. Uh with several things going on this uh, week, um, you know, drive manufacturers are wondering, what should we build if we want Microsoft Azure to buy one of our SSDs? And it's, it looks, it's looking like you're going to use the, the one you long, sort of 18 millimeter double thickness and require yeah. a Project Denali interface to it. So uh, for SSDs, a couple things. One, we publish a spec uh, twice a year of actually what we think we're gonna buy in the short term, and it has some heads up of kind of long-term direction. And so uh, on anything that's server attached, boot drives or some local temporary data, all permanent data is stored in storage, but you know, some of the compute offerings offer some temporary data. Those are all M.2s in the current motherboards and the motherboards under development. So we haven't changed what the compute attached to the short EDSFF, for example, it would be a good candidate for that. We haven't done that. Um, and we might, we, you know, we haven't started architecting the follow-on. Uh, for the all SSD storage, we're doing a JBOF, and the advantages, and we're gonna lock the SKU in a couple months, the advantages of, of that form factor are cost, you're, you're buying less controllers per capacity and, and uh, fit less failures. And so the failure case for SSDs are, are controllers and firmware corruption and miscellaneous components and NAND is last, and there's actually things you can do to mitigate against a NAND chip or NAND die going bad. And so, um, you know, so we're we're working on that system. Uh, we are going to be pushing the SSD spec. We'll have some uh, more tactical NVMe uh, standards uh, proposals in, in the coming months. We're working on one right now. Um, and, and the Nolly is a research project uh, based on the, the results, you know, business units like ours, you know, would be excited to, to take advantage of any, uh, any advantages there. So, looks like we're uh, about yeah, out of time perfect. Here. And then June, Liu, and... Yes.